Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and welcome to Spirit Church. Today, I'm talking about exposing the false gospels. These are doctrines that have crept into the church that many are proclaiming, but are not biblical. So I'm gonna address three of these gospels that have permeated throughout the nation and other parts of the world. And I'm hoping that today, as you listen to this message, that as you come with an open heart and open mind, ready to receive from the word of God, that you would become keen and aware and observant when it comes to these false gospels. They are not the true gospel, and we need to speak out that with the true gospel and by comparison, expose the false one. So, Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's gonna lead you in this worship song, one of my favorites, We Exalt Thee. I want you, as you sing this song, just worship the Lord. Um, I really want you to try in your heart to just let go of whatever it is that may be troubling you right now. Lift your hands, close your eyes, sing with us this worship song, and allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to touch you right now. Stephen Moctezuma. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Just invite them in wherever you're at. We'll invite you here. We'll invite you. you in, we invite you here with me, oh, oh, oh. Father, we praise you this night, God, wherever you're at, just begin to praise him and thank him, Father, we thank you, God, oh, oh, oh. Father, we bless your name tonight, God, wherever you're at, just bless him. Sing with me for thou, O Lord. you God, we exalt you God, yes we do God, oh, we sing I exalt, and I
joining with us tonight, God. For allowing us to worship you, Jesus. Father, we thank you, God. Okay, so I want to get right into this because there's a lot on my heart when it comes to this topic. So there are three Gospels that are actually the false Gospels, and I only use the term Gospel uh, for the sake of communication. But I'm going to talk about these three, and the three Gospels I'm going to be addressing are the Prosperity Gospel, the Extreme Grace Gospel, or Hyper Grace, and then I'm going to be talking about the Gospel of Works. Now these three Gospels, they sound true, they sound good, they sound enticing, but when compared to the Scripture, are found to be just deception that has entered the church. So I'm not presenting this message to be critical. I'm not presenting this message to be negative or to be mean. I'm presenting this message so that you can recognize the true gospel. And really, when we preach false gospels, it produces false conversion. When you preach the true gospel, true conversion comes about. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But if you don't know the truth, then you're still bound. So I'm going to talk about these three Gospels, and then I'm going to present the true Gospel in comparison. And as you see these, these Gospels contrasted, I pray that your heart is open, your mind is open, your eyes are open, and that from now on you're going to be able to look at those and recognize them for what they are. Now, all terminology aside, I'm going to be using my own terminology here, and I'm going to be defining these Gospels very specifically because I'm not one who wants to divide the body of Christ or criticize somebody just because they believe a little differently than I do. I, I, in fact, I, I, I look more for points of unity than I do um, to try to expose, and that's not what I really like to spend much of my time doing anyway. I like preaching the real gospel. But this is necessary to present to you, the believer, so that you can be one who preaches the gospel in truth, in fullness. It needs to be clear. It needs to be compelling. It needs to be uncompromised. And it needs to be correct. So I'm going to get into this now. But first, I want to talk to you about the standard by which we measure all messages. Now, you could say, well, Brother David, you just believe that because that's the way you were raised or that's the way you were taught. But the truth is that aside from the way that I was raised or aside from how a belief comes to be believed, how a belief is formed is not really as important as whether or not that belief is true. And so I'm going to give you my criteria for how we determine truth. And once we've set that standard, then we're going to compare all the other belief systems that I talked about objectively to that standard and see how they hold up. So first of all, I want to share this scripture with you. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. And this is what the Bible says. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ the one who was crucified. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 in the King James Version says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Again, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 in the King James Version. So we see that Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the standard. He is the plumb line. He is the measurement. And all beliefs, all ideas, all philosophies, all thinking has to be compared to the standard that is Christ. Now, if Jesus is the standard of the gospel, then we can actually see where these deceptions find their root. We can actually look at these gospels, these belief systems, and pinpoint exactly what causes such beliefs to be formed. So the nature of idolatry is is not what you might think it was. I mean, you've probably heard it said that idolatry is if you put anything before God, right? And idolatry is used, uh, that term is used to describe um, putting your priorities out of order. So, for example, let's say anything can become an idol. They'll tell you, they'll say, okay, if, if you love your car more than you go to church, or if you, if you, if you uh, spend more time with your family than you do at church, or if you enjoy you know, entertainment more than you enjoy reading the Bible. These are things that we use to say are idolatry. And we say God needs to be number one, which is true, but that's not what idolatry is. Because if that's what idolatry were, then it would be an arbitrary standard and there would be no real, there would be no real truth, no real grounded truth that we could see and say, okay, I am definitely violating this. So I mean, it's different per person. Some people, God is going to require more time for the ministry. I'm one of them. God requires me to put more time into ministry than he would the average believer. And God would require more 
uh, of something else from you than he would from me. So it's, it, even though the convictions are the same, even though the commandments are consistent, even though the truths are objective, God still has a personal relationship. Jesus has a personal relationship with each and every one of us so that to call idolatry the, the wrong priority list or, or you know, to, to not put good, uh, God on the number one scale, um, that is not exactly true. What idolatry is, idolatry is a false perception of God. And this false perception, whatever it may be, whatever the, the, the waywardness might be of that false perception, however that causes you to view Christ is idolatry. So idolatry, fundamentally speaking, is false perception of God. It's when you describe God in a way that he is not or remove from him an attribute that is a, a, a big part of his character. So idolatry is addressed here in Psalm chapter 135, verse 15 through 18. This is what the scripture says. The idols of the nations are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak and eyes but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear, and noses, but cannot smell. And those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. How you perceive God directly affects how you live your life. How you perceive God directly affects how you interpret the word. How you perceive God affects every part of you, your life, your decisions, your thoughts, everything. This is why it is so important that we accept the revelation that God has given us of himself. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. Jesus is the full, the complete, and the sufficient revelation of God. There are not two gods. There is not the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. They are one and the same. You see, the Old Testament gives us a picture of just how depraved man really is. Many, many times people look at the scripture and they try to, you know, indict God on being immoral or being cruel or being um, bloodthirsty or being a, a God of vengeance when really the Old Testament gives us a picture of what we actually deserve. So many look at the Old Testament and say, well, God was so cruel to punish people in such a way for such silly little things. But that just goes to show you just how depraved man really is and just how disgusting sin really is. So the Old Testament presents the justice of the same God who is revealed in mercy in the New Testament. So they're not two separate gods. They're one and the same. And those who criticize God for being what they say is so-called cruel don't understand just how severe sin really is. So we see that Christ Jesus is the standard. He's the full revelation of God. God looks like Jesus. Jesus looks like God. In fact, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So Jesus Christ is the perfect revelation of God. God is eternal. God who could not be comprehended. The incomprehensible God was revealed in the fullness of who Christ was, and it was a complete revelation. Not one part was lacking. That's the miracle of the incarnation of Christ. That's the miracle of what happened when he came to the earth and revealed himself. So we know by this scripture in Psalm chapter 135, verse 15 through 18, the scripture says that the idols are basically dead. And then it says in verse 18, and those who make idols are just like them, as are all who trust in them. What's my point? My point is, you become like that which you worship. You become what has your focus. You become what has your worship. Whatever has your attention, you become like that. And so if you serve a false perception of God, it's going to show in your everyday life, and it's going to reflect in the way you think and in the way you act. It's going to reflect in the, in, through the perspective, through your perception, and how you perceive the word. You become 
like that which you worship. So idolatry, a false perception of God, becomes the basis for heresy. Really, this is why the Gospels seem so convincing, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So the fundamental problem with false Gospels, or the false messages, or false understandings of God and how He's revealed Himself, is usually these Gospels, and again, I call them Gospels for the sake of communication, usually they're missing a fundamental trait of who God truly is. They lack a trait of His personhood and therefore become falsehood. Now, this is why proponents of false gospels can sound so convincing. I mean, I'm telling you, people can convince themselves of whatever they want to believe about the Bible. If you want to make the Bible fit your perceptions, there is so much truth in here. It, it is, there, there's such a vast amount of knowledge about God that if you really wanted to, you could make the scripture fit your perception. But the key to finding truth is to see God not as you want to see Him, but to see Him as He has revealed Himself. Now, this is difficult because it has to do with setting aside presuppositions and preconceptions, and it has to do with seeing God through a lens without opinion and letting the Word speak for itself instead of you trying to put words in the Bible's mouth. So when we go to the Scripture, we must strip ourselves of all presuppositions, all preconceived ideas, and we must come to the Word with a pure heart, open-minded, and ask the Holy Spirit to aid us as we read the Scripture. So, again, this is why they're so convincing, because the, the convincing aspect is that of these false Gospels is that they'll take Christ and remove a single trait from Him. And when they've removed a single trait from Christ, what they'll actually do is they'll start to, to paint a picture, and they'll pull out all the Scripture that has to do with the traits of Christ that they want to believe exclusive from his other traits. So in other words, let's say, for example, because I'm going to touch on the prosperity gospel first, I'll use that for an example. We know that God wants to bless us. I, I believe that God wants to bless us. That's the truth. But what they'll do, those who believe the prosperity gospel, is they'll take the aspects of God, the traits that where he wants to bless us, and they'll remove and ignore all of the scriptures that demand sacrifice and discomfort from the life of Christ and the life that he demands us to live. And so what they do is they take a part of Christ and they hold that up. And that part looks convincing because it actually is backed in scripture. This is why we need the full counsel of the word of God. This is why we have to compare scripture with scripture, truth with truth. There is no contradiction in the Bible. But we have to recognize that they work together. For example, the, the, the problem um, that they say with free will, that's, you know, that God has given us choice, God has given us free will, and predestination. You can find both in the Bible, which is why the debate is so heated. But if you find both in the Bible, it should be simple enough to, at least to admit, even though we can't solve exactly how this works itself out. I mean, there are ways that it can work out. For example, you can say that we're predestined among many predestinations, and God knows the many results of our possible choices, or middle knowledge is what they call it. Now, that's just one way to explain it, and I'm not saying I know which way is exactly how it works, but the point is that those two ideas can come together in harmony in one way or another, and the same goes for how we perceive Christ and the different perceptions of Him. So we know that God wants to bless us. We know that God wants to give us things. We know that God wants to give us homes and even in some cases finances. If you don't believe that, um, I, I can't help you, but the scripture does teach that, you see. And some people with a poverty mindset reject the prosperity scriptures and the people with the prosperity mindset reject the poverty scriptures, but they're both there. So we have to find a balance and we have to find what the scripture is actually saying in fullness. So false gospels are in essence false perceptions of Christ. So the prosperity gospel, let's get right into this first one. Now I'll define the prosperity gospel like this, a message that promises and prioritizes health, wealth, and happiness while disdaining sacrifice and hardship. Now, to be clear, I believe in prosperity, but I do not adhere to the prosperity gospel. Now, you talk about millennials. My generation, I mean, we, we think the 1% is evil. We think that, oh, America is just some, you know, you know, some tyrant that's, you know, 
dominating the world, and really silly um, doctrines that people have been brainwashed and programmed to believe by our universities, our colleges, our entertainment, our media. And it's, it's really all, it's anti-biblical, really. So I don't believe that the wealthy are evil. I don't believe that excess is ungodly or excess is evil. I mean, the truth is that if you're an American, you already do live in excess. And if you want to condemn excess, you got to also take it to your life and realize that prosperity, at least by human standards, is relative. So basically the prosperity gospel, though, though I do believe in prosperity, I don't adhere to the prosperity gospel. It is at the very root humanism. It is new age and it finds itself in every generation presented in a different way. So the issue I, I wrote this down and I wanted to get this wording just right because you often hear of many doctrines that come into the church and, and people say, oh, you're being religious or oh, you're being too fearful or oh, you're being divisive when we disagree with certain things. And I'm not going to attack any people specifically. I'm just attacking a, a, a fundamental thought. But the issue is not the gospel presented in disguise, this, the disguise of modern thinking. So I don't have an issue with that. I don't have an issue with presenting ancient truth in a modern way. That's all well and good. So the issue is not the gospel presented in the disguise of modern thinking. The issue is modern thinking presented in the disguise of the gospel. Now, in many of our churches, we tell you it's about you. It's about your dreams. It's about your success. Now, if you go to church week after week, and all they're ever talking to you about is your dreams, your success, your day is coming, your breakthrough. And really, if we're just being honest, when we think of breakthrough, when we think of success, we're thinking about money, we're thinking about um, notoriety, we're thinking about ministry breakthrough. You know, I don't know how many times I've talked to Christians, and, and really our generation, just as a side note, is very obsessed with this idea of fame and being known. And, and really, that's all emptiness. I love the way there's a, there's a fellow preacher a friend of mine who says that fame as a drug shot in vain. It says, pity those who want it, pray for those who have it. So fame is empty and yet our culture seeks it. And so often when people hear the preacher, they're listening and he says, your day is coming, your day of success is coming, your dream is gonna come true. Well, most people right now in the United States that, that adhere to this type of message, they have a vision, a dream of themselves on, sta on a stage singing before thousands or in a band or an actor or, or really wealthy or really you know doing well in business. And again, maybe God does have that for you, but it is a lie, it is deception to say that every Every one of us are going to have that. That's just not the truth. That's not the gospel. And if you go to church week after week and all they talk about is your dreams and not giving up and pushing through, and those are great messages if you're talking about evangelism, if you're talking about praying in the Holy Spirit, if you're talking about global evangelism, if you're talking about building the church and discipleship and a vision to expand the kingdom of God, that's wonderful. But if all we're ever thinking about is our dreams and how we're going to succeed and how we're going to do well, it is not the gospel. It cannot be. You know, I think about the persecuted church. I think about everything going on with ISIS. I think about those who are being beheaded and kidnapped and raped and tortured. And they're being kicked out of their homes and forced to flee as refugees from all different parts of the world. And they're under tremendous pressure to even meet as a church. They face the threat of death to just have a Bible. I think of those and everything that's going on in the world and I think of how self-centered and narcissistic the prosperity gospel has made many people in the church. Because here, really, when we look at those things, we think, oh man, poor them, but I'm not one of them. I'm special. I'm unique. Who among us is too good to be martyred? Who, I mean, isn't that what the scripture says, that, that we're all a seed that, that's planted in the ground? Or, or do we stand out so much that, oh, that's, they're the statistic, that, but that's those people in other countries, not here, not me. What if God asked you to lay down your life? What if that's God's will for you? Because it was for some of the apostles. You talk about the will of God. Most of the disciples were tortured and killed. They were killed for what they were preaching. I mean, I was having uh, dinner with a friend of mine the other day, and I was just explaining to him where I, where I am in my heart right now I mean, I, I, as you know, as I've said before, I don't take a salary from the ministry. I have other means of income. Though I am full-time ministry, I have other means of income. There's books. There's, there's, uh, I do some writing on the side for different projects and whatnot. I mean, I can go on. I'm, I'm very resourceful. 
And I haven't taken a salary from the ministry since it's begun. I still to this day don't. And maybe one day that'll change, but, but for now, unless the Lord tells me otherwise. But I was looking at my life, and you know, my wife and I, we, we, our, our condo is not huge, but by standards of how people are living on other parts of the world, it's, 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 it might as well be a royal palace. I mean, it's small, but it's clean. I was thinking, I drive a car. I have many changes of clothes. I have enough money in the bank to just, you know, just so there's a little bit of security, not too much. I'm not wealthy, but I'm well off. And I thought, man, you know, here I am. And then the ministry that I do, I know God called me to do it, but sometimes I got to check my heart. I look around and I get to come and talk in front of cameras here in Southern California. And I said, Lord, I would hate to get to heaven one day and found that I lived in too much comfort to receive the reward that you had for me. I mean, we were driving around. I said, look, I told him, his name is Reuben. I said, Reuben, look, we can drive in. I can pull into this restaurant right now. I said, look at this area we're in. It's nice. It's nice weather. We, we're, 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 we're not even 30 yet, and we're already living better than most 30, 40-year-olds in all parts of the world. We could just walk in. We have the free will to go in at any restaurant, just sit down and eat. And then we and have the money to do that. Some people are living on 30, 40, 50, $100 a month. And I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. I'm not saying this to condemn uh, the blessings that God has given us. I'm saying this to make you think. How bad do we really have it compared to other believers? And why are we so obsessed with having it much better than we already do? I mean, I think about the persecuted. I think about what's going on in those nations. I think about the refugees. Go preach the prosperity gospel to them. Talk to them about their dreams. Again, if, if you go to church and that's all they're ever talking about, you need to be careful. If all they're talking about is your dreams, your visions, your success, you're going to get to the place. If your goal, and they, if when they're preaching, all you're thinking about is that day when you've reached the pinnacle of what you think is the best life. If you've reached you're healthy, you have a lot of money, or you have enough money, and, and everyone's happy, and your whole family's happy, and everything's good and perfect. Shouldn't the goal be souls? Shouldn't the goal be to win the loss to Jesus? Shouldn't our ideas of dreams fulfilled and success be that more people are coming into the kingdom? Shouldn't that be our goal rather than setting ourselves up for the ideal situation? I'm not condemning those things. I'm condemning the heart, and so does the Scripture. The Scripture condemns the heart that puts those things as priority. So we count ourselves special above the statistic or not someone who needs to do that. Why? It was interesting. I was reading uh, a friend of mine. He was actually, he had sent me a quote, and I don't remember it verbatim, but it was from a... Um, a Muslim, and it was one of the leaders in Mus uh, the I Islamic world, and he had talked about, he said, you know, and again, I'm paraphrasing, he said, we've done more, and he's talking about the Muslims, he says, we've done more in the last 50 years than you Christians have done in the last 2,000 years. He says, and the reason we have is because we are committed and you are not. And then he said, we will win, you will see. Break your perspective from the bubble we live in here in the States. I know many of you watch from different parts of the world, and you're probably amening this. But we're entering some interesting times. And I would hate to see the falling away of the faith simply because it wasn't what we thought it was. I'm here to tell you that God wants to prosper you. God wants to bless you. Yes, I believe that. I preach that. I, I, I'm all for that, but not as a priority. In fact, the scripture says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. It says, Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. For the most part, 
let me just say this. I'll put it to you this way. For the most part, the cost of following Christ is a lot more than most of us imagine it to be. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, or verse, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Not sinful. He said selfish. Turn from your selfish ways, your self-centeredness, your narcissism, your egocentric view of life, your, 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 your idea that it's about you and your dreams and what you want to accomplish. And maybe God has those things for you. That's awesome. But you need to get a hold of God and find out what he has for you. This is what the scripture says. From your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. John chapter 12, verse 25. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. But those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. And this is Jesus talking. John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Not if, when. The prosperity gospel rejects Christ's cross. And that is the foundation of, of its waywardness. Now, a world is going to hell. That's the truth. Every day, over 150,000 people die, many of them without knowing Christ. Are you okay with that? Does that stir something in you? We need to preach a gospel that affects people's eternity, not just their life here on earth. We need to preach a gospel with eternal implications, not with material implications. We have a, ha a generation that's going to hell, and in that generation that's going to hell, we have a generation of Christians who are obsessed with themselves. Paul said, I didn't come to you preaching ourselves. I came preaching Christ and him crucified. It's not about your dreams. It's about God's will. All I ever hear nowadays is dreams and success and one of these days. And Church, we can live that abundant life right here, right now with joy, peace, patience, meekness, all of the fruit of the Spirit. We can have it now. And we don't have to attach our joy to material things. Are you looking forward to the day that you're celebrated by men? Or the day that the Lord tells you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, I want to read you something. Talk about changing your perspective. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 16 through 33. Now, this is a lot of scripture, but I want you to hear it. And I want you to hear what Paul is saying. Paul the Apostle is talking about people who boast. And then he's going to tell you why he boasts. 2 Corinthians 11, 16 through 33. Again, I say, don't think that I am a fool to talk like this. But even if you do, listen to me. As you would to a foolish person while I boast a little. So he's, being, he's using a little bit of satire here. He says, don't, don't think I'm foolish, but if you want to think I'm foolish, then at least listen to me like you would a fool. Such boasting is not from the Lord, but I am acting like a fool. And since others boast about their human achievements, I will too. After all, you think you are so wise, but you enjoy putting up with fools. You put up with it when someone enslaves you, takes everything you have, takes advantage of you, takes control of everything, and slaps you in the face. I'm ashamed to say that we've been too weak to do that. But whatever they dare to boast about, I'm talking like a fool again, 
I dare to boast about it too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my filling that weakness? Who is led astray, and I do not burn with anger. So this is a powerful verse right here. I'm, I'm going to stop here. He says, who is weak without me feeling that weakness? In other words, he's talking about people in the church whom he, whom he has won to Christ. When they feel weak, he feels their weakness. When they feel down, he feels down. And then he says, who is led astray, and I do not burn with anger. How many of those backsliders don't break my heart, he's saying. If I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who was worthy of eternal praise, knows I am not lying. When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Eretus kept guards at the city gates to catch me. I had to be lowered in a basket through a window, the city wall, to escape from him. This is what Paul boasts about. I mean, we see people, I sold this many books. I have this many viewers. My church is this big. You hear the pastors bragging. My church is this big. Or my church is better than your church. Or my church is, we're just so great. We're, there's no church like this. I mean, it, it's so much competition, it, it's disgusting. And here's how Paul brags. He says, I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've faced death again and again. We need to rise from such a message humanism where it's all about you it's all about how to improve yourself the gospel is not about self-improvement it's about self-abandonment so that is my confrontation of the prosperity gospel now i want to turn my attention to this extreme grace gospel i'm going to define it here a message that disdains the confrontation of sin and offers forgiveness without repentance while insisting on positivity. You will know one of the hallmarks of this gospel by any time you mention anything that's harsh from the word. If you talk about sin, if you preach against or confront things that people should not be doing, if you bring that, which is a healthy thing to bring, again, you don't want to spend all your time being negative. This is all about balance. If you bring up anything that has to do with correction or rebuke or or God's justice or God's wrath or the consequences of sin, they will jump on you and they'll call you immature. They will call you out of touch. They will call you old fashioned. That's not the world. That's the church that will do that. And there's this great pressure that they're putting on people to conform as if, if you're not always 100% positive, And again, I call it positivity bordering on delusion. If you're not always 100% positive and everything's happy and everything's great, then, then you, you have maturing to do. No, no, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. And we know that not because of what men say, but because of what the scripture says. This is the authority. Our example is Christ, not men. So God's grace is extreme, I've heard people say. So I call it extreme grace. They go, well, brother, God's grace is extreme. No, God's grace is sufficient. He said it himself. My grace is sufficient for you. It is able to accomplish what I will it to accomplish. Either way, 
Wordplay doesn't produce truth. This is why I've defined what I mean by extreme grace. So again, we can play with the words, well, God's grace is extreme by definition. I understand that. But all wordplay aside, all semantics aside, that doesn't produce any truth. The truth is that there is a gospel message that is being preached that disdains the, confront, the confrontation of sin and it offers forgiveness without repentance while insisting, insisting on positivity all of the time. The truth is nobody wants to hear it anymore. This is the itching ears that have produced this gospel. Nobody wants to hear about sin. Nobody wants to hear about the things that they're doing that are wrong. And we, we think that, 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 is, that, that we should adapt our message to what the world wants to hear. When did they ever welcome the message that confronted their sin? I mean, I think of Isaiah chapter 6, where God says, go and tell this people, you'll speak to them, but they're not going to listen to you. Jesus even said, if someone doesn't receive your word, you move on to the next town. Jesus came preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Paul the Apostle writes that, that God requires repentance of us. But nobody wants to hear it. If the prosperity gospel rejects Christ's cross, extreme grace rejects the justice and holiness of Christ. But the truth is, faith without works is dead. I'm going to read James chapter 2. I want you to read what the writer is intending to portray here, the message that he's trying to get across. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. The Bible says this, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? Verse 17. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we have shown to be right, we, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. I'm going to read that again. Verse 24. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Now skip the other verses there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. There needs to be action that accompanies your faith. This heresy is especially alluring because it comes with the promise that we can, I mean, how do I want to word this? This heresy is especially alluring because it promises that the world at large will embrace our message. That's the danger. That's the magnetism. That's the, that's the seduction of this doctrine, is that it comes with the promise that the world will celebrate us. But I've never seen that in the Bible. And I understand that we want the world to be changed. We want to make a difference in culture. Yes, I get that. I understand that. I'm all for that. But we have to make the, the difference that God wants us to make. See, 
many of the church, many parts of the church, they're starting to turn to where they want to become almost one with the culture. And you're not going to be able to tell the difference once you step outside of a church service in the lifestyle of either a sinner or a saint. There's no, that, that line has been muddled. It's, it's indistinct now, and we're becoming one with the world. Again, as I said with the prosperity gospel, it's as if we're taking a worldly message and we're disguising it as the gospel and we're peddling this in the churches and we're, we're celebrating this and we're applauding all the things that are being done. Look at the differences that are being made. And all that is happening really is that we are preaching deception to people and that deception, rather than offend them and wake them up to the reality of sin and hell, we are lulling them to sleep and comforting them as they march toward the fires of hell. We are making them confident as they march toward destruction. This is the danger of the gospel of heresy that is the gospel of extreme grace or hyper grace. It looks good. It looks like we're becoming friends. It looks like the world is embracing the message, but they're not because you don't see it in their life. And the scripture says very clearly that it's not just by what you profess to believe. It has to show in how you live your life. This teaching also is somewhat humanistic because it teaches that man is essentially good, not depraved. But this is what the Bible says. John 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Verse 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. We want to be like the world. We don't want to offend them. We don't, want to, we don't want to push them away. And I understand that. And, and look, this is the truth. We have to be loving. We have to be kind. We cannot be rude. We cannot be hateful. We cannot be mean-spirited. That's not what I'm calling for here. But we must, we must at all costs be truthful. The whole truth, part of a truth is deception. Deception can, someone could be deceived when they believe in just part of a truth because they're not getting the full picture. Luke 6, 26 says this, What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised false prophets. That's coming from our Lord. I've heard preachers dance around issues of sin. I've heard preachers spin and they call it wisdom, when really it's, it's cowardice. And, and, and they're proud with how political they can be instead of just standing on the word. It's not a matter of maturity, it's a matter of principle. Paul the Apostle, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 12, he addresses sin head on. Now, I'm not saying we're to beat people down. I'm, again, you have to understand, I'm talking about extreme views, so I'm trying to bring it back in an extreme way to bring the balance. So, so I'm not talking about being mean and beating people down and calling them filthy sinners and calling them names and making them feel terrible about themselves. I'm talking about presenting the truth about the destruction of sin, the reality of hell, and the beauty of a Savior that can save us from both sin and hell. Why do we look like the world? I'm going to read you one more thing on this one because Jude really addresses this. The book of Jude, I'm going to start at verse number three. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. <laughs> Doesn't that just jump right off the page? I'm going to read that verse again. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into the, your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, 
for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. He's talking about judgment. A lot of people say that there's no more judgment. It's all. This is the truth. There's still very heavy consequences to our actions. And so he says, I remind you that he rescued the nation from Israel, yes, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And also, verse 7, And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams, there you, that's key word again, all about our dreams. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. I'm going to keep reading. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of all the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, The Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. Verse 10, But these people scoff at things they do not understand, like unthinking animals. They do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them, for they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brothers. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They are like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars doomed forever to blackest darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and complainers living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. Think about it. They flatter people. They tell them, God's going to give you this. God's going to give you that. God loves you. God, I mean, we, we know he does, but God loves you despite your sin. You don't have to be judged. And there's this heresy that's being presented and they're flattering people, telling them, you're going to be this. You're going to be successful. God's going to raise you out of that even if you keep living in sin. And, and it, it's flattery and it's deception. Verse 19, these people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They're the ones causing division. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's Spirit in them. Look at these grace preachers, hyper grace. Again, I'm not criticizing everyone who says the word grace. I believe in the grace of God. I'm addressing an extreme here. There are no miracles. There is no power on those churches. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourselves safe, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. We are told to hate the sin in other people's lives. That's, that's, the, that's the Bible. I didn't say it. It's right here in the scripture. And this gospel message, this, this heresy of grace, hyper grace, needs to go. And so I want to get you thinking about that. Now I want to go down to the gospel of works. And we're going to, I actually got to end this fairly quickly. The gospel of works. 
I'm going to define it here. A message that declares salvation through discipline rather than salvation through faith while inspiring fear in, and depression in its adherence. Religion says you must do in order to become. God says you must become in order to do. Now, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 1 through 10. Actually, let me start at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse... I'm sorry, for the sake of time, I wanted to cut it, but I, I'm going to need it for the context. Ephesians 2, 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, but by our very nature, we were suspect to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loves us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ, and seated us with Him in heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ. God saved you by His grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for those good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do good things He planned for us long ago. Now, the gospel of works demands that you do in order to become. You have to act and follow a strict set of rules. Rather than relying on the supernatural transformation of the heart that causes you to become a new creation and therefore changes your actions. In other words, they reverse it. I want you to picture salvation as if it were a tree. Now, on the tree that is biblically incorrect, you'll see in the roots are good works and the fruit is salvation. That's not how it works. You need to reverse that. The truth of the matter is, is that in the tree of salvation, the roots are transformation by God. They're supernatural roots and that the fruit is good works. So good works do not save you, but good works are an indication that you have been saved. So it's not that I'm looking to change my actions. It's that when I surrender and repent of my sins, God, as only He can, supernaturally transform me and transforms me into a new creation that has new desires, that is capable of living as God has instructed me to live, filled with His Holy Spirit, and one who desires the Word. The religious spirits of today will try to get you to work for it, try to get you to do in order to become. God says you must become supernaturally by faith in order to do. So I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. How does this compare with the verse from James? Well, it's very simple. James was not saying that works save you. He's saying the kind of faith that produces works saves you. So it's still, as a matter of fact, faith that does the saving. And it's faith by grace through Jesus Christ that we receive such salvation. So I wanted to touch on this a little more, but uh, there's, a, there's a lesson I have up called The Advocate and the Accuser. It's on this channel. I think it'll go perfectly well because the spirit of religion brings about condemnation and guilt. So I address that emotional side of the attack of the enemy. Here I just want to address the cerebral side. So the gospel of works is um, not something that we should adhere to because it puts, puts us in charge of our salvation rather than God. Let me tell you something. You didn't do anything to save yourself, and you can do nothing to keep yourself saved. In fact, the scripture says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, this is what the apostle says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you by himself to the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again, what we have said before, if anyone preaches other good news than the one you welcome, let that person be accursed. Do you know what the other gospel is that he's talking about here? He's not talking about 
the hyper grace. He's not talking about the prosperity gospel. The gospel, the other gospel, is the gospel of works. Those who were demanding circumcision, those were, who were demanding adherence to the Old Testament law in order to be saved, those are the ones that God said, let them be a curse. They're Pharisees, they're religious, driven by demonic beings with demonic doctrines, putting on oppression through lies rather than bringing about freedom through truth. So the gospel of works rejects the mercy and grace of God. The gospel of works puts it all on you and it becomes performance-based rather than faith-based. Now, the true gospel, I, I have several teachings here on there and in fact, I'm going to put a link on this video. If you're watching this in the app, you will not be able to get to the link, but um, you can look in the description and you can find that it is on my website, davidhannesministries.com and you go to the blogs and I have written one on salvation and it's called Faith or Works or something like that. We'll put the link in the description. Again, if you're watching this on the app or if you're watching this on my website, you should be able to click right, click right to it and link up to it. And if you're watching this on YouTube, the link should work. But if you're watching this on the app, you have to go and watch this on YouTube, this exact video, and you'll see the link just below. And I want you to read that because that's my take on true, the true gospel. And I may have to address it another time. For now, I'll just say this. Imagine that before you is a hallway. On the other end of this hallway, there is a door. Now, on the opposite end of that door is another door. That first door that you open is justification. So I open that door, justification, I'm in the hallway. The hallway is sanctification. And sanctification is the process by which you become more like Christ. Justification is the moment, it is, the, it is a stamp. So justification is a stamp, sanctification is a process. Justification is a position, sanctification is a journey. Justification happens the moment you believe, the moment you trust God for your salvation, the moment He saves you, the moment He transforms you. You are justified. Your record is wiped clean. You trade records with Christ. You take on His perfect record. He takes on your imperfect record on the cross. I'm justified the moment I believe, and there's nothing that can change that. I'm in through the first door, and I can shut that door behind me. Now, no matter where you are in the hallway of sanctification, no matter where you are on your journey to becoming more like Christ, you can rest in the peace of knowing that that door of justification is sealed behind you. You're in the hallway. And so long as you are in the hallway, you are on your way to that final door. And that final door is glorification, where you're just like Christ, where you're just what He wants you to be. But that journey, maybe you take a couple steps back, maybe you take a couple steps forward. So long as you're through that first door, you're in the right place, and you are saved by God's grace. So the truth, though, is that a man will not embrace a Savior, no matter how wonderful the Savior, if he does not believe that he needs to be saved. No one goes to the doctor and just goes right in for operation without being told why they need the operation. The gospel is good news. What's the good news? Jesus saves. What does he save us from? He saves us from sin and hell. You see, the gospel isn't good news until people know the depravity and the severity of their sin. Until they receive the prognosis, until they, ex they will not accept the prognosis until they have received the diagnosis. And that is the balance with which we, we, much, we, we must preach the gospel. It has to be the full and complete. So, well, those are the three false gospels, the prosperity gospel, the hyper grace gospel, and the gospel of works. And the true gospel is the fullness of who Christ is. Now, I want to pray with you now. Let's believe that God is going to show you further. And I, I encourage you, study this more. This isn't the end of the discussion. Uh, this is just a very, very um, short survey of these things. And I want to maybe possibly get into this in further discussions, and maybe you can discuss with us online. I don't respond to the YouTube comments. I don't even see them. Uh, but if you want to participate in a discussion, the best thing to do is to go to that link that links to my blog, and I will more likely see that than I will see any YouTube comments. But let me pray with you, and let's believe that God is going to help guide you and open your eyes as you read the Word. So Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for those watching right now and that one watching who desires to know you fully and who desires to know you, the God of the Bible. Lord, I pray that you would anoint us with your Holy Spirit guide us with your word and instruct us daily as we 
desire to know what the true gospel is. And Father, I pray that as we preach the true gospel, that we would see true conversions, true miracles, which are salvation. And Lord, I pray for the emboldness of the Holy Spirit. Lord, embolden your people right now. The righteous source builds the lion. So Father, I pray for a holy boldness to come on those. And Lord, I pray that we would not shrink back in Jesus' name. Lord, that we would not shrink back and cower in the corner as the gospels that are heresy are being preached. But Father, that we would rise with boldness and we would rise with confidence and we would rise full of the word. Father, help us to preach the gospel without compromise. In Jesus' name we pray. And I want you to say, Amen. Well, that's it for this edition of Spirit Church. If you would like to be a part of the preaching of the true gospel, maybe you're tired of all these these heresies that are out there and you're saying, you know what? I feel so powerless. I feel like everything's changing and there's nothing I can do. Here's what you can do. You can help me out. You can partner with me as I continue to spread messages like this. Every dollar that you sow into this ministry helps us to reach more people. For every dollar, I think we estimated that I can preach the gospel to 30 people for every dollar you sow. Think about that. That's that's the reach of media and television and events, guys. So I need your help. I need you to partner with me. Consider a one-time donation today. Don't wait. Do it today. 10, 20, 30 dollars. Some of you could do 100, 500, 1,000 dollars one time. And we need monthly partners, 10, 20, 30 dollars a month, even five dollars a month. If you can do something, do it today. Do not delay. I need your help. We need to get the gospel message out there. People need to hear the truth. And every time you sow into this ministry, you're doing that something that you thought couldn't be done. Well, again, that's it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.